Well, now we turn to rhythm and blues and the period after 1945, closing in on 1955 and our at least provisional date for the um, birth of rock music. One of the things that we have to keep in mind as we think about how this music originally associated with um, R&B culture starts, or, or black culture starts to make its way into urban areas, is the migration that occurred in this country from the rural south to the urban north. The idea that, that, uh, that blacks who were live, working in rural environments and fields and, and doing farm work and that kind of thing would get on the train and go to the end of the stop wherever it landed north and that place north might be Chicago, it might be Detroit, it might be Baltimore, it might be New York, but whatever. They wanted to get out of that kind of life and into the um, increasingly available faculty uh, or uh, uh, factory and service uh, jobs that were available in the big cities. And this was especially the case during the Second World War where everybody was being pulled together to, to, um, to build the things that we needed uh, to compete in that war. So there was a, a giant migration into the cities. Uh, we're still talking about a time when things are pretty segregated so people are moving up from the south into the cities but still staying together in their own neighborhoods and that plays a big role in how it is that R&B uh, is able to become such an important uh, force. Well, once these people are all in these areas, there are independent labels, and now we start to talk about indie labels, independent labels um, that start to take advantage of this. These people are here, they want to hear music, we will put out records that they will perhaps buy, and, uh, and this is how you get these independent labels, which are mostly regional, mostly uh, in certain cities. So we can talk about places like Chicago, and New York, and Memphis, and Los Angeles, and, uh, and, and these kinds of places. Baltimore, you name it. Um, in addition to talking about indie labels, which we'll have to do, we also need to talk about regional radio. Now, a couple of, several uh, lectures ago, I talked about how when the radio audience migrated from radio to television, it left a lot of openings in radio because the, the, the syndicated programming that those stations were using didn't disappear immediately, but it was clear that everybody was putting their money into television because that's what the next big thing was. And so there were real opportunities in radio. People who had these stations started changing their orientation. Rather than being a local affiliate for a national network, they started to think regionally. They started to think, well, if I'm going to sell advertising, how can I sell that to some kind of a group right here locally? And it turned out that one of those groups they could sell advertising to was the black community. Uh, and uh, that's, that's a fantastic story of this, of this moving to television, making opportunities for radio stations that could now focus on rhythm and blues music. So we'll talk about that in just a minute. For, for now, let's go through the, the story with indie labels and the rise of R&B. There are uh, at least, well, there are, there are probably dozens of independent labels we could talk about uh, that have to do with rhythm and blues, but there are some that are really important that we, have to, that we have to take some time thinking about. Let's first start with Chess Records, which was formed by Phil and Leonard Chess in Chicago in 1947. Chess Records is mostly associated with the style of Chicago electric blues uh, that we hear in artists like Bo Diddley, Muddy Waters, Howlin' Wolf, and also the first records of Chuck Berry, which aren't so much Chicago Electric Blues, but Chess was the label that Chuck Berry was on. Of course, he made an awful lot of money from them. But Chess did more than that. They had other uh, black artists on their label who were doing things that weren't just Chicago Electric Blues. They had doo-wop and other kinds of things. But what they become, ha have become known for is the Chicago Electric Blues of the 1950s. Now, when you think about an independent label like Chess Records, you have to figure that Chess Records consists of Phil and Leonard Chess and maybe a secretary who answers the phone and does all of their paperwork for them. They've maybe got a couple of rooms of offices and so they do their, their office work by day and then at five o'clock they clear all the desks away and create a space in the middle. Somebody comes in with a tape recorder and they actually do their recordings there. Now as they started making more money they were able to get increasingly better facilities but these, these uh, independent labels, I mean they are really just living on a shoestring here. They're having their records pressed in order to get them to dis distribute it 
you basically are going around to record stores yourselves with the, with the records in the trunk of your car, distributing yourself. So there's certain limits to how much business you can actually do if the way you're doing it is these very limited uh, circumstances. And so this, this indie status had a way of sort of keeping indie labels small. In fact, there's a certain kind of penalty that can come to you if you actually have a record that gets too big too fast, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. Now, in distinction to chess records, which was a, those chess recordings are usually um, appreciated because they have a kind of rawness to them. There's a certain kind of uh, unbuttoned um, ruggedness to the way the records sound. That's what people like. The early British blues rockers from the early 1960s, they loved that aspect of what was going on in the chess records. And to a certain extent, I'm not sure the guys at chess wanted them to sound quite like that, but that's what they had available to them, and that's just the way they sounded. But it became the mark of what a chess blues record would sound like. Now, in distinction, uh, in sort of contrast to that, we turn to Atlantic Records, which was formed just a year later in New York by Ahmet Ertegen, who would become one of the most important people in the music business in the second half of the 20th century, uh, and Herb Abramson. That was a slicker, more traditional approach to R&B. Traditional in the sense that um, uh, there would be arrangements done for tunes, so the artists would come in reading charts. There would be professional session musicians who would do these these uh, these sessions, where as opposed to to Chicago at Chess Records, people would show up for the session. They'd kind of make stuff up as they went along, and this was really kind of an imitation of what main of how of how a mainstream pop recording session would go. And the people at Atlantic Records tried to get the best possible sound they could out of their recordings. They didn't want them sounding rugged. They didn't want anybody to say, what a fantastic raw sound. Of course, they'd like a kind of a raw performance, but the actual sound of the recording, they were very particular about. And Atlantic had a guy by the name of Tom Dowd doing all the engineering. And Tom Dowd has become one of these legendary figures in the history of, uh, of rock music for being one of the first guys to really uh, master the recording studio and get some great sounds. In fact, we talked before about Les Paul and that first eight track uh, recording uh, machine that he, got, that he called the Octopus that he got thanks to Bing Crosby. Well, the second one that was made was made for Atlantic Records and Tom Dowd had that machine. And so Atlantic was making recordings on eight track Oh, 15 years before the Beatles, Sgt. Pepper. Um, so they were really concerned about sound quality. Some of the artists they had in the period before rock and roll were Ruth Brown, who was really kind of their go-to artist. Uh, Ray Charles was on the, uh, was on the label at that time. Uh, Big Joe Turner and the Drifters all had, uh, had hits on the R&B charts for Atlantic Records. The other important indie that we definitely need to spend a little bit of time on is Sun Records from Memphis, Tennessee, founded by Sam Phillips in 1953. Now, Sam Phillips didn't start in the music business in 1953. He had been an independent recording guy. His thing was he would go out and record all kinds of things. Usually he'd be recording, you know, uh, choirs that sang um, um, church music and that kind of thing. But on the side, he was recording a lot of African-American musicians because that was the kind of music he liked. In fact, before Elvis Presley came into his studio and recorded in 1954, Sam Phillips was recording and releasing almost exclusively black artists. In fact, an important record, Rocket 88, which was a number one R&B hit in 1951 for Jackie Brenston and his Delta Cats, interestingly enough, with Ike Turner, later of Ike and Tina Turner Review on piano. Uh, that record was actually recorded by Sam Phillips in his, in his studios in Sun, but then leased to Chess Records, who released it in 1951 on the Chess label. They bought the rights to the recording uh, from Sam Phillips. So he was involved in doing a certain amount of that. But when he got his own artists, uh, maybe his biggest artist early on was Rufus Thomas, who had uh, some uh, hits for him on the R&B charts. But then he was famous for having, having signed Elvis Presley in 1954 and then having sold Elvis's contract to RCA. Other artists he had later in the 50s, Jerry Lee Lewis, Carl Perkins, Johnny Cash, was also, uh, and Roy Orbison, were also on the Sun label in the second half of the 1950s. But that gets ahead of our story. Other important indie labels in R&B, Specialty Records in Los Angeles, started by Art Rupee in 1945. He would later uh, release all of the singles uh, by Little Richard. Imperial Records, also in Los Angeles, started in 1947 by Lou Chud. He would release all those Fats Domino's records, although all the Fats Domino's records were recorded by Dave Bartholomew uh, down in New Orleans. And then interestingly, Dot Records uh, in Tennessee, run by Randy Wood and started in 1951, which released the records of 
Pat Boone, of all people. Interestingly, the story about Pat Boone is that uh, we like to think about him as being exclusively appealing to white artists, but Pat Boone actually had a bunch of hits on the R&B charts. Now, we want to we just take a minute to contrast those indie labels, Chess, Atlantic Sun, Specialty, Imperial, and Dot, with what would have been the major labels in the 1950s. And those, those labels were, and the slide will come up and you'll see these as they go by, um, DECA, which was started in the UK in 1930. Mercury out of Chicago, RCA Victor out of New York, Columbia out of New York, MGM affiliated with the Hollywood studios out there in Los Angeles, also Capital uh, out in Los Angeles, which was taken over by EMI, the, American, uh, the British label, uh, in 1956. You can see the artists that are affiliated with each of those major labels. Those labels, when they released a record, could get it into national distribution almost immediately. The indie labels were regional it was very difficult for them to release anything nationally. And so you had these fantastic major labels that were focusing almost entirely on mainstream pop, and that left room for these independent labels to focus on R&B, mostly not bothered too much or harassed in any way by the major labels, until rock and roll hit, and until these R&B labels started to uh, sell big numbers of records, then all of a sudden, the majors took notice and they were going to start fighting back. But that gets ahead of our story. In the next video, let's talk about the role of radio and the rise of R&B.